The title of this message is Gender Roles. Gender Roles. Or I could maybe word it better, Gender Roles That Work. We live in a world of gender dysphoria. The adversary is destroying the identity of people and he's destroying families. They obviously think they're wise, uh, the, the philosophers of this world. The people from the, that set the tone from the great Ivy League, as that joke goes, the new axis of evil. North Korea, Iran, and the Ivy League. <laughs> or is it Harvard? But <clears throat> they think they're wise. They're so smart. But really, they're being led by the axis of evil. Worldly wisdom is not tethered to reality. 1 Corinthians 1.20, 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? They were biblical scholars and that kind of thing. Where is the disputer of this age? You know, the great lawyers. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? It is foolish. A lot of things they're pushing are foolish. Like unfund the police, improve the police, yes. Unfund it, no. Um, and a lot of other realities. They're saying that masculinity is toxic. It's like saying what God made is bad. They're actually also saying that motherhood is a lesser role for women. I know they... But that's what they imply by the things they do. Actually, motherhood is a wonderful thing. I mean, it really is. Women are designed and built to be mothers. I, I realize that there are exceptions and all that. Some people don't need to get married and have kids. But for the vast majority, motherhood is a wonderful thing. Um, Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. If you call motherhood a waste of a woman's abilities, that's really calling good evil and evil good. Who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. They think they're so smart. You heard those Ivy League people in front of Congress, they look like idiots saying, well, you know, uh, genocide, I can't say genocide is bad, it depends on the circumstances. What? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. Of course, later they backtracked and tried to, afterwards they got their PR department. Said, but we didn't actually mean that. Yes, they did. They were caught with, with their foolishness and their pants down. Um, what we find is the world's been attacking young men. There's been a war on young men. Um, and you realize that um, these things are not good. So we're going to look at the role of men for a while. First, uh, this world is undermining the role of men and undermining men. They're giving men bodily confusion about what is manly. Also, they can't define what is a woman. I'm not making that up. They can't define what is a woman. You know, it's the XY chromosome, but, but you know, it's simple stuff. Um, and if I were... If I had said this 20 years ago, you would have laughed. That's the craziest thing I ever heard, but it's real. They can't define a woman or a man. It's like, eh. <clears throat> they, they blur the gender, and they're replacing gender with androgyny. Matter of fact, I looked at that one of the women testifying in front of Congress, and I said to my wife, you know, if you look at her, because I knew her name was female, and, that's, and she's got a little smattering of lipstick. Except for that smattering of lipstick, you, you couldn't tell whether that was a man or a woman. My opinion, that you, you might not, at least how I saw it. I said, almost androgynous. Um, society is attacking manliness, fatherhood, and motherhood too. Young men now delay marriage. I heard this on the radio. They say the federal government is now saying that young men and women don't leave adolescence until they're 30 years old. And I heard it on the radio, I thought, I can't believe it. 
how they made that up. Do you realize that if you, if you roll the clock back 100 years or so, even less than that, when men were 14, they were considered responsible. I mean, they were called young men. You know, they didn't expect them to be, you know, big time leaders, but they were young men. Like George Washington almost joined the Navy at age 14. One of, one of his better decisions not to, but, you know, became part of the Virginia militia. But my point is that um, and a lot of women used to marry. I'm not saying it was always good, but they'd marry 15 and 16. I mean, it was common, you know what? And they would be running a home by the time they were 16 or 17. You say, what? Um, women mature earlier than men. It's just a biological fact. There are exceptions, but you know what I mean. The point is, um, if men delay marriage and women delay motherhood, by the way, that's one reason we're having the population problem. Uh, that's one of the problems for Western culture. We're, we're not replacing ourselves. That depopulation is a, is a problem for the economy. Like one man said, he remembers when Toys R Us was promoting abortion. He said, you see how stupid that is? They're killing their own market. And one day they woke up and there weren't enough young children with the competition they faced and they went out of business. He said they were killing their own market. The, the point I'm getting at is, when you delay responsibility, problems happen. Um, you know, for instance, if a young man drops out of the workforce, and a lot of them do, that means they're delaying their maturity as well. Having all these immature young men running around is bad for society. You can see some of the problems, can't you? Irresponsibility, dangerous. Something I've noticed. I noticed that about 10 years ago, one of my colleagues was talking about her son turning 16, and he had no interest in getting a driver's license. He wanted his mom, that was her, driving him all over places. I said, what? Because I remember when I was 16, that was the biggest, I mean, in my memory, biggest thing in the world, mastering parallel parking so I could get a driver's license and be a man. I mean, you realize that. That's how you thought. You got a driver's license. I remember saved up $100 for my, <laughs> believe it or not, paper route stuff, and got my first car, a 52 Robin Egg Blue Ford Coupe. Anyway, it was a, it was a big deal then. I'm, my only point is, that's what young men did then. They have no desire to get dri many driver's licenses. They don't have normal ambition. As Michael said, if they can't get all the luxuries quickly and through an easy pattern. They don't want a whole lot of hard, hard work and a long climb. That's not what they want. So they're not that interested. Um, and, um, and the guy that wrote the book War on Men, he put men into four, the modern men into four categories. He says, this is what, how we're developing our young men. I want to just read it. Um, the soft man, the man that's becoming an effeminate. Obviously, you know, that's not good. Um, the exaggerated man, he takes on extreme machismo, but he really isn't strong. Just dresses and acts that way, made with tattoos. The lost man, the lost man just kind of abandons his role in any responsibility. Doesn't do anything, just kind of lost. The gender stuff has him lost. The angry man, the angry man is embittered by what he sees so he puts his strength to evil, violent purposes. Obviously, that's not good for society. He says the, the, what we really need are strong, developing strong young men. And he equates that with Christianity, of course, helps. Um, he says they're telling men to reject masculinity, that it's toxic. It's toxic to be what God has made you. You see how crazy that sounds? But they're actually pushing it. It's toxic. Um, he says a, a strong man, he's not soft, but he treasures women and is gentle with women and children. And he says young men are suffering. For instance, and there are a lot of stats. Young men make less money than young women. I was talking to a, a somewhat young man, not all that young, but 
about 10 years ago, there were all kind of help wanted signs all over town. He wanted a little part-time job and he applied. He didn't get any of them. It's easier for women to get jobs now than men. He's a big, strong guy, but you know, I think he was a Marine corpsman, but there's nothing wrong with him, no bad record. He couldn't understand it. There's a bias against men out there. Oh, it's subtle. You're not going to, no one's going to advertise it. And I remember Tucker Carlson, one of the first ones, he rattled off all kinds of statistics. And I said, you know, he's right. I'd never thought about it. Um, he said public schools are now run in a way that favors girls. And I, when I was a kid, we had a lot of male teachers in elementary and junior high. Few now, elementary and junior high, they're all female. I'm not against female teachers. I'm just saying young men need role models everywhere, including in the schools, and they don't have them in most public schools now. Um, anyway, a stat from 1999 to 2019, young men 16 to 24, 17%, almost 20% dropped out of the, the workforce, and that, and that decline is, is getting higher and higher. In other words, it's even worse. This is what they had in 2019, the last time they got measure. It's probably much higher now. Why are they dropping out of the workforce? I'm not 100% sure, but like they're discouraged. They make less money than women, have a hard time getting a job. They're not doing as well in school. There are 50% more women in college than men. I'm not saying that's all bad, but it's not a positive sign. And, and, and my wife looked this up. All the major law schools, all of them, have female deans. And I'll bet you they're all radical feminists. Now, I don't know that, but I'll just bet money it's true. And what's scary is those are our future judges. And I looked at some of the things coming out of some of those law schools. They're our future judges? Man, we're, we're in bad shape in the future. Think about it. We're in bad shape now with bad, unjust judges, but it's going to get worse unless something, there's a huge change. Um, young men are not maturing. And now some of the problems are probably drugs and big tech. Uh, you know, they put these screens on their head and they live in a false world of technology, but it's not real. They're not developing socially and in other ways as well as they might. Um, it's a false reality. First Timothy 4.8, and Paul writes, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness profits more. But he did say bodily exercise profits. What we think is happening is, too hefty a percentage of young men are sitting on the couch playing video games, good thumb exercise, but they're out of shape. And I saw this a couple years ago, and they were talking about getting men into the military, and I, and I think this is correct. Two thirds couldn't qualify. A hefty percentage couldn't qualify because they couldn't get through basic training, which isn't that hard. They actually have it now where, at least when, when I read the article, um, they tell you you have at least one month, and if you can't make it, they just let you out without any dishonorable discharge, just let you out. But a lot of them couldn't even pass the physical to be recruited. They just, I guess it's, I don't want to, Make, make light of it, but they're just too heavy, no wind power, uh, no, they couldn't do push-ups, sit-ups, and a bunch of them, and another chunk, have drug problems, or couldn't pass the minimum IQ test. And, it's, and they've lowered the standards, by the way. I think, wow, isn't that amazing? That's a measure of the decline in men. So um, we should encourage young men to you know, get a gym membership. Build yourself up. It's part of being masculine. You know, everybody is not built to be Arnold Schwarzenegger type. I understand that. And men are different and women are different. And everybody's unique. But to some reasonable extent, you want somebody who's 
can work hard and lift things and you know what I mean be reasonable um, here's a corny joke kind of makes a point the teacher said George Washington not only chopped down a cherry tree um, his father's favorite cherry tree but he admitted doing it now Louis do you know why his father didn't punish him and Louis said to the teacher yeah because he still had the axe in his hand <laughs> Well, all this poor education and bad media influence is going to create a certain amount of dangerous young men running the streets. Irresponsible. You see that, don't you? And right now it may be a blue city, inner city problem, but if things keep going, it's going to be a problem for a lot of places. We think, oh, it won't affect me. I hope not, but you see the bad trends. Young men need help in this declining world of no standards. They're told that gender is fluid. There is no, uh, is it 52 genders now? We heard 52. How you can get 52 genders is mind blowing. And this is what we're getting from academia. They polish these weird ideas and give an academic polish. First Corinthians 16, 13. Be on the watch, unmoved in the faith. Be strong like men. This is Paul writing. Let all you do be done in love. So be a strong man in love. 1 Timothy 4.8 For bodily exercise profits a little. I know you, but you already said that, but I want to say it one more time. It profits a little bit. So if somebody gets to see this video in the future, hopefully... Uh, Encourage your young men to exercise more. I know you say, that was probably too late for many of them, but I don't think it's ever too late to build yourself up a little bit if you can. The world is discouraging the development of strong, decisive, ambitious young men. And they're also discouraging the forming of families. By the way, the formation of new families has been declining drastically the last 20 years, and the decline is getting greater. That actually hurts the economy, because the formation of new families affects the furniture industry, the housing industry, uh, often the car industry. So it helps the economy, just like having young children helps the economy. It, it all helps. Just one more corny story. This is called expenses. My brother was recently launched into the real world, and he was shocked by the real world and the expenses that came with it, like the high cost of car insurance, especially when you're 18 and 19, it's cost more. He was shocked. And his dad starts saying, well, you know, son, if you got married, your premiums would be lowered. And he said, that would be like buying an airline to get free peanuts. <laughs> That joke shows you how young men feel about marriage. I'm given an opinion that some young man told me. He said, look, we can get what we want without getting married. I'm not saying that's right. And they don't want the commitment and the financial. Can you see that's irresponsible and not good for society? Um, now let's talk about development of young women for a minute. Um, what type of leadership should young women aspire to? Radical feminism as opposed to a proper addressing of women's issues. Because women did have issues of salary and employment and things, and I don't want to make light of all that. Um, but the radicals didn't want to just improve problems women had. They wanted to dismantle the family they wanted to degrade motherhood. They wanted to make homemaking a bad thing or a waste of a woman's talent. And they pushed this message in education, on the media. And by the way, I'm not against career women who don't want to marry and their whole job is to making money. That's fine. But that's not going to be what most people should do, if, if you think about it. That's not going to be what most people should do. Um, and what is the most important institution in any country? The most important institution in any country is the family. Now think about it. 
strong families produce strong children that produce a strong nation. Uh, I was going over one of those things about why America had such great success from 13 little colonies on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains within a little over a century into the world super economic superpower and all actually had, uh, well they didn't call them colonies, they called them possessions, but to possessions off the coast of China, Guam. How did that happen so fast? in about a century because the strong families had such population booms that they outnumbered the rivals. You know, um, the British, the Northwest frontier tried to hold them back, but there were just too many. And a lot of those young men were excellent shots too. And anyway, I'm going to the, co you know, the covered wagon, you know, all that stuff, probably better than I do. But it was strong families that made America so successful. And when Alec de Tocqueville came in, I think it was 1830, and he toured America, wrote his famous books, he said America was great because America was good. And he talked mostly about people going to church and their families, and oh, he said some bad things about America too, but it was mostly good. And. Um, you think 1831? America had problems. You know, they were they were fighting with the influence of Andrew Jackson. You know, so if you were to look at that time period, you think, well, what do you mean? But he was impressed with America. He also said something else that kind of caught me by surprise. He said the most educated population in the world. This is 1830. Was America? Like, what? And then I realized something. In Europe, a large percentage of the population were peasants. I mean, they're better off than slaves, but the peasants were on these big estates, and they had marquees and lords and earls and others that ran it. Um, but the poor people in America, now he said we had a widespread education over the general population. Now he said there are people in Europe that have more depth, you know, a few people who knew a lot of things deeper than Americans, but as far as widespread education, I never heard anybody say that before. And he was a he and his partner, they're both lawyers, but they were smart, young French aristocrats. But it's probably a fairly objective view of America. I bet you never thought of that. America, even way back then, had strong families. Um, and we were hearing today about what education was like in the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade in America. They knew the Constitution, math, better than many college graduates do today. I mean, relatively speaking, education was pretty good in those days. They could cipher. This is without calculators and stuff. They did very well. Um, but it was because of strong families, because of strong mothers, mostly, and strong fathers. Motherhood is really important, and we don't give it the importance we should. Any healthy society needs healthy mothers. We need strong, masculine men, and we need, and with love, and strong women with love. Isaiah three twelve. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. And then, you know, God says he's upset. When you read that, you think, God is mad at women and children. Not really. One of my teachers at Big Sandy said, what that really means is the men had relinquished their responsibility. The reason the children were out of control Impressing society because men had relinquished their responsibility. And there are all kind of stats. Kids from fatherless homes have a much higher rate of incarceration, um, teen, unmarried pregnancy, a whole bunch of problems, drug problems. And, and even liberal presidents like Bill Clinton, Barack Obama have said that. So it's not like only conservatives have seen it. It's a real problem. Um, and I'm, and I'm not, and I'm sure single moms do great jobs, many of them, but you'd have to admit, isn't it going to be harder for a single mom to raise three or four kids all by herself? And when those boys get bigger, that's, they're going to, and the girls too, they really need a good father figure. Um, God wasn't mad at women. He was mad at men for neglecting their responsibility or abandoning their leadership. Radicals want to replace uh, motherhood would radicalize women. Um, 
And some of them are actually teaching women to dislike men. Now you say, that is not possible. That's normal sexual attraction. I'm telling you, I look at some of the stuff they've written and read, and I sense a certain, we don't like men, and you shouldn't like men either. Pushing them toward, I guess they would say, alternate lifestyles. Unbelievable. Um, men or women should, of course, try to do the godly thing, which is the loving leadership of the family. Um, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. And then I'm going to jump to 11, 1 Corinthians 11, 11. 11, 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is a man, and the head of Christ is God. Verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor a woman independent of man. He goes on to elaborate what Paul is saying. The two need to cooperate with each other. They must cooperate with each other, if that makes sense. They got to cooperate with each other. And they are teaching young women to cooperate with men. I don't think they are. They need to cooperate with each other. The two, the man and the woman, must cooperate and not be rivals. It's not a question of who is the greatest and who is the best. They each have different skill sets and play different roles. 1 Timothy 5.14, Therefore I desire that younger widows marry, bear children, and manage the house. Now I want to talk about management. When uh, Paul says manage the home, that's what he's talking about, you're going to think, what does that mean? That is a big deal. Women's leadership is managing the home. But isn't the home the most important institution in, in the society? Women's role is to manage the home. Now I want to talk about management a little bit here. Um, the, by the way, leadership and management are not contradictory roles. They actually work together and complement each other. Like in a big corporation, you'll have the CEO. But then he'll have an operating manager. And he may have different titles, different companies, vice president of operation, but he might have all kinds of titles. But they work together. The CEO sets policy, direction, and kinds of things. But the guy that runs it on a day-to-day -day basis is the executive assistant. Let me give you a military example. I just happened, hadn't watched one in a long time. We, we watched the Star Trek, was it about four, five, six days ago. And I noticed something. The captain, first officer, and he calls him number one, was Reichert. If you remember, Commander Reichert. Some of you, if you've seen this series, a, a handsome young man, well, at least he used to be young. I don't think he's so young anymore, but he was a handsome young man, and he ran the ship for the captain. Everything went through him. Matter of fact, in the military, you get in trouble if you don't go through the executive officer. You don't go around them. Anyway, um, but... And he runs the ship. The captain doesn't have to worry about a lot of the details. He's got people to run it. Now, let's say in an infantry company, uh, it would be the uh, first lieutenant and the platoon or company sergeant. And they would be the executives. They, they kind of divide the responsibilities up. But they run the day-to-day -day things and make sure the men are ready. They got all their equipment and all kinds of little details about who's on leave. If we have to leave to go into some action quickly, can we get everybody off leave back to the post? And, um, and the Navy, um, it's the same thing. You have a commander, executive officer, and the chief petty officer. But the principle is the same. You have two levels of management, the CEO and the executive officer. Women is kind of like external leadership versus internal leadership. The captain talks to other captains and fleet admirals and the big wheels about strategy and what they expect. And he knows internally his ship is going to be run by the people, the executive officer who's running things. Well, that's how families are. And things work better if the two work together, complement each other. Um, like in the case of a magazine, you'll have an editor and a managing editor. Well, the guy who looks at all, let's say if you're a writer and you present an article, you don't present the editor, you present it, set, present it to the managing editor. He says, well, we got 40 articles. 
I got to talk to the uh, editor, see what trends he wants to go in, what dangers we face, what do we want to do. And But I'll look at your article, consider putting it in. Um, but if it's on this topic, you might get the front page or whatever, or you make some changes in it. Um, and the two, the editor and the executive editor, work together on that magazine. <clears throat> and um, those things are good. It's a good way to look at it. Mom is the number one, just like Reichert was number one on the, uh, the Enterprise. Uh, that, by the way, is the carrier that won World War II, was the Enterprise. It's uh, a great military story. And uh, actually, it may be a side story, but it's worth mentioning it. And one of those battles in the Solomon Islands was, I guess, it was actually a stalemate, but a stalemate for America at that point was a victory. It kept the Japanese from invading New Zealand, Australia. At any rate, it was a positive thing. One of the Japanese bombs did hit the Enterprise, and the chief, one of the chief petty officers, they have, they have fire suppression things in big ships. And that's one of the big time responsibilities. He figured out some way, I forget the details, to suppress the fire that bomb created inside the carrier. Because those carriers have all that fuel. And you know, the fuel for aircraft is highly explosive. You could just imagine if one of those things went off, that ship would go down and, well, well at least possibly the war might have been lost. Or at least it would have been a lot tougher for America. He figured out a way to put it out, and there's, I can't remember all the details, but what I'm saying is those executive people make key decisions. They actually run the, uh, the flight deck, too. There's a name for all that, and you can, you know, you'll hear about it as they launch the ships, the planes, to go into combat. But just like Reichert was number one, mothers are number one in the family. And their design, they can multitask better than men. Their design, they have that more sensitive side to handling children. I'm giving an opinion, but I think it's true. Women can smell better, because smell is important with dangers around the kitchen and all. Maybe they can hear better. By the way, men have better long-range vision than women do. You guys, well, why did God do that? Well. In most of man's society, if you're going to hunt, because a lot of hunting has been popular, longer range vision is better. So theoretically, men could be better hunters and probably better warriors if you have to defend your village from a neighboring invading village. But can you see how God has equipped the two genders to play their role? And both roles should be honored and not dishonored, but that's what modern feminism has done. So managing the home is important. Motherhood is so important. Um, and you want to, the world needs wives that support their husbands and husbands that support their wives. You know, God says husbands should love his wife like Christ loves the church. You think about a high bar. That's a high bar, right? But we should strive for it, even though it's a high bar. But you want a wife that supports her husband. I'm going to read 1 Timothy 5.14 one more time, because I like the scripture. Therefore, I desire the younger widows marry and bear children and manage. I mean, that, man, that's a form of leadership. God made women better at multitasking. Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another. Now, how does men and women submit to one another? Isn't that really saying the man gives certain tasks to the wife and just, you know, for the most part, lets her do it, and she lets him make certain decisions. You know, she's submitting to his leadership. Uh, in the military, of course, you have to do that. They got rules and stuff uh, for how, you know, certain people have to be used and stay out of trouble. Um, but submitting to one another, and then he says, husbands, love your wives. Both men and women have a high, high bar to achieve. Men support women in their roles, and women should support men. If you're a man, if possible, find a woman that really loves you and will take care of you and support you. You know that song, Stand By Your Man. That's a, well, it's a good principle, right? It's... Yes, I know I singing could do, lose some improvement here.
<clears throat> but I still love it. Stand by your man. Anyway, <clears throat> so the woman should be smart in business. Now I'm going to Proverbs 31. That's the noble woman section. Proverbs 31, verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants vineyard. She girds herself with strength. So you want women that are strong, but in the right way. Strength in her arms. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches her hands to the needy. So you want a woman who takes care of her family. You know, she can do business because real estate is business. And uh, she's beloved in the town because she does charity. Now that's the kind of training you want to give young women, to be that kind of person. Verse 23, your husband is known in the gates. That's City Hall. Her husband has a better chance of being a leader because she is behind him. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is a law of kindness. That's the great woman to have. She's wise as well as smart. Verse 27, she watches over the ways of her household. She does not eat the bread of idleness. Obviously, if you can marry an industrious woman, that's better Obviously, you know, a woman wants to marry an industrious man, too, of course. Um, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. He praises her. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. As you get older, you start to realize, you know, that certain things like youth pass away faster than you think. So if you can marry someone with some degree of character, you're better off. Um, Acts 16, 13. I want to give a church example. Acts 16, 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside. Be, by the way, you're going to say, why did Paul not go to the synagogue? This particular city did not have enough Jews to build a synagogue. But Paul knew Sabbath keepers would would gather outside the city limits. There's some legal reasons why they did that too. By the riverside, like that famous song says, down by the riverside. Anyway, and they'd be keeping the Sabbath where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women we met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple. Now that was the city of Philippi. I'm going to just simplify the story. Lydia took Paul and his companions in. Apparently she was a successful maker of cloth and dyes, which was a big business deal in those days. She helped Paul found the church of Philippi. Guess what? which church was the most beloved church based on the writings of Paul in the New Testament? You guessed it, Philippi. And it was a, a strong woman who helped Paul found that church. And by the way, um, if you look up all the women in the New Testament, there are a lot of women that Paul says really helped his work a lot, and they should be congratulated. And we have women hosts in our churches. And I was thinking about it. I was on the board with two of the great women of the church, Mrs. Shirley Armstrong and Mrs. Chapman. And uh, if you were on the board with them, you could see their wisdom. I can't just have to be there with them. They both passed away now. They're older than, than I am. But, but great women. Actually, you can make an argument. If it weren't for those two, a lot of things the church has now would not have. They, they helped us make wise decisions and directed their husbands in the right direction. Um, 1 Peter 3.7. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. So what should the husband do? Give honor to the wife. Obviously, if a man is terrorizing his wife, and you know, that's a criminal offense, of course, beat up your wife. Obviously, that's not godly and you know that's not appropriate masculinity. I would even argue a man that has to beat up his wife to feel like a man is really not a strong man. He's really a weak, frightened, deficient man. Think about that for a minute. That's not a sign of a confident, strong man. He has to terrorize his wife. As to the weaker vessel, and by the way, weaker is not putting women down. Paul is just saying the obvious. And you can read the stats. Men have like 30% more lung capacity, 
the ability to build more muscles than women. I know there are exceptions to every rule, but you know what I mean in general. Um, and he says that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, husbands and wives working together is a spiritual thing. If you and your wife don't get along, it will affect you spiritually. It'll hinder your prayers. Now you're going to say, well, what recommendations can we make? I got some of these from other sources, but, you know, I, I, um, I'll share what I found from other sources. First of all, the more men we can call into salvation, the better. We need more, and, and young men don't go to church nearly as much as they used to. And I know what we think of church as being for women, because most churches have much more, more women than men. But men need it, and we need to encourage young men to get converted. But also encourage young women to get converted. While there are more women in church than men, there are less young people, men and women, going to any kind of church. Obviously, hopefully they'll go to churches that teach the Bible and the proper roles for men and women. And a lot of churches that don't. Um, second, we want to ennoble men and women to appreciate what they are. A man, a young man should appreciate being a masculine man, and a woman should appreciate being a feminine woman. Now, obviously, people are unique, and everybody, some women are going to be more tomboys, and some men are going to be more sensitive and artistic, but even with those differences, men should still basically be men, and women should be basically women you know, with whatever unique characteristics you have. Third, we should prepare boys for work and financial responsibility because men need that so they can take care of the family. And a lot of young men just seem to be abandoning that role or they don't take it seriously. Um, and men need to, men and women need to get training on how to interact with the other gender in the correct manner. And I think the closing of schools and things like that have created it. And my final comment is the gender fluidity and stupid philosophy that's going into our world, we need to teach young people to reject it.